All right, Judge, we are on and live, and I'm going to tell that computer that it's okay, and then we can start. Okay. All right, we are ready. All right, good morning. Um, it's a pleasure to see you both here and on the screen. Welcome to our JCIT meeting for uh, Friday the 13th of 2022. Um, we're gonna get started by reviewing our minutes from our last meeting. If you'll please check those and really make sure that uh, we know if you were here or not, check those minutes, make sure they're accurate uh, at this time. So do I have a motion to adopt these minutes from March 4th, 2022? I'll move. Do I have a second? Second. All right. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Aye. Okay. With that, with these minutes of March 4th, 2022 are adopted. Um, our next uh, uh, matter on the agenda is the um, e-filing Texas and Research Texas guide and file kind of update uh, on the system and who is going to present We have that. Uh, Terry Derrick with Tyler Technologies here today. It's Terry and I have been able to share uh, screen sharing so you should be able to share your screen okay. and drive. Great. Down. Okay, give me just a second and I will pull that up and then uh, verify that you can see it okay. We certainly can, go ahead. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Well, it's a it's an honor and a, a privilege to be here as always. I, I do appreciate the uh, the opportunity to do it remotely today. I'm uh, leaving town this weekend uh, for a user conference and uh, and can appreciate the time uh, that that I get back by by being able to attend remotely. Um, and it's and it's good to see everyone's faces uh, as as usual. Um, I'll, I'll jump right in to provide a, a status update on the program and, uh, and then answer any questions that may be, that may be available or, or present. So in terms of our transaction volume, the program continues to, to thrive. It's, it's, a, it's a continued upward uh, progression in terms of user accounts that are created, uh, but we have seen the filing volume somewhat plateau. Uh, we do see a large portion of the incoming volume uh, increases coming from our JP offices, which I'll talk talk to and speak to in just a moment. But today we have over uh, half a million user accounts that have been created in the system and we're processing over 40,000 envelopes each and every day. Uh, we're also collecting over uh, $14 million uh, each and every month uh, for the state and for the counties through the system, which is, which is a pretty, uh, pretty interesting uh, data point if you, if you think about how much that is that's processing through the eFile Texas program. I mentioned a little bit earlier that our JPs are increasing the volume. Today, we've got 166 precincts across 43 counties that are live. We've got 14 active engagements that we are also bringing live. But that volume from the JP offices uh, averages about 105,000 uh, filings per month, so a little less than 10%, uh, right at about 9% of the overall state's uh, filing volume. So as we bring on more and more JP precincts, uh, we'll continue to see that uh, that filing volume inch up uh, each and every quarter that we that we go through it. One interesting uh, data point we haven't really figured out why uh, this is happening is around our redaction solution and utilization. Uh, we've seen about almost a sixty percent increase from last year's utilization to this year's utilization, and we're averaging over twenty thousand. Uh, new utilizations of the redaction tool uh, every month. Uh, it's really difficult to understand what's caused the shift. I don't know if there were uh, rule changes or something that has that has driven the increased utilization of the tool, uh, but it is good to see that, that we are averaging a higher utilization rate uh, here in 2022. One uh, uh, discussion point that we talked about in the last uh, JCIT update that I do want to hit on is an update on our Senate Bill 41 efforts. 
If you recall, during our last meeting, we talked through some of the nuances and the changes that Senate Bill 41 uh, provided in terms of how we operate. It does provide a more efficient manner so that we're actually collecting the money and sending it directly to the state recipient as opposed to sending it to the counties who would collect it and then do those disbursements at the end of every month. That, that additional uh, efficiencies did come at a cost though for uh, processing as uh, the state collects those funds in four different accounts. And so that changed the way that we collected uh, those transmissions. And uh, it went from a two-way split to a six-way split. And that resulted in the interchange fees for the credit card processing to be assessed six times instead of twice for each transaction that was collected. So that obviously increased the expense uh, profile of, of operating the system this way. It also created uh, an um, inefficiency with regards to how the filer experiences those payments being collected as they show up as multiple charges on their credit card. So there's two things that we need to go and chase down. One is to uh, recover the, uh, the additional expense for processing those transactions and create a long-term sustainable model that'll that'll provide that. And then secondly, we need to create a, a mechanism to uh, make a, uh, the filer experience when those payments are collected a, a more efficient uh, way. Pause for just a second. Um, sounded like Casey stepped out. Is Were there any questions? Yeah, Casey stepped out because he's working on um, the back computer. So he'll okay. be right back. Now, so. Okay. But, but I, I, did have a, I did have a question on that, Terry. Sure. Uh, this is this is Tracy. So we've had we've had attorneys reach out to us, saying, "What are all these charges?" Because uh, they don't realize it's coming from you and not us. And then they're they're wanting to uh, uh, basically do chargebacks on them because they think they're fraud. So is there? How long do we think it's going to take to get it down to where maybe it's two transactions instead of six or more? That's that's Some great, Tracy. Wonder. That's, that's, that's great. That's a great question. So that actually is a perfect segue into what we're doing. So there's two things that we are doing. Uh, one is more of a short-term solution. The other it requires a little additional work, and I'll go into the details. So uh, our contract with uh, the OCA allows for Tyler to charge a $1 minimum convenience fee in the event of situations like this. This isn't a, a revenue generator or a profit generator for Tyler, it was intended to, to, put, to protect for situations that, that were beyond our control with regards to payment processing, just, just like this scenario, things that we couldn't see into the future that may impact the increased rate of, of those convenience fees. And so that, that model would result in if the convenience fee was under a dollar, we would essentially round it up to a dollar and if, it, if, it in, if that in, convenience fee increases beyond a dollar, then we would charge our standard 2.89%. Uh, those smaller, what we call micro transactions, those that are um, in, in a small uh, quantity in terms of how much result in those uh, convenience fees that really cost uh, the, the most to, to process. So um, what we've done is we've implemented that $1 minimum convenience fee that's helped us then cover the additional interchange fees that were assessed to Senate Bill 41. This isn't a long-term solution. This is a short-term solution to just stop that additional expense uh, from being impacted. There's really two different long-term solutions that would not only correct the, the, the processing and allow us to then reduce that convenience fee minimum down to a lower rate, but also then result in the better user experience for the filers by seeing a fewer number of transactions. Uh, one of those would require us to basically act as a principal agent for the state comptroller and essentially create an account on their behalf, manage that account on their behalf, and then collect that money and then do the disbursements each and every day. Um, we, we don't know if that's a viable option. We don't think that it is because of, of the, the nuances of Tyler managing an account for the state, um, yeah. but that is an option for us to consider. The more long-term sustainable solution, I think, is to become what we call a payment facilitator or a payfac for short. Uh, what this is, is it, it, it's Tyler would operate as what we call one of these payfacs, and it essentially allows us to collect those funds throughout the day 
And then at the end of the day, do a, a split for each of those four accounts that need to, uh, that, that the state has, uh, that, they, that they would like for us to put those in versus doing that on every single transaction. And so we would do those disbursements at the end of the day uh, to each of those accounts, doing the split four times instead of four times for every single transaction. Uh, that would reduce the uh, cost of, of managing the, the system in, uh, in concert with the rules uh, around Senate Bill 41, as well as reduce the number of transactions that are on the, uh, the filer's credit card for each time that a payment is made. Um, this is gonna take some work. It's, it's, there's not only programmatic changes uh, to make that work, but there's also, and more importantly, um, a lot of uh, regulatory changes that we'll have to make. You gotta provide a lot of information in order to become one of these payment facilitators. And, and there's a, several steps that need to occur before you can get positioned into that. So uh, Tracy, I don't have an ETA on that. I know we're working towards that as our long-term solution right now. Um, but I don't have great visibility into what all the obstacles are that we'll have to overcome in, or, in order for us to be able to become a, pay, a payment facilitator and operate in that capacity. Uh, oh, I was going to say, so Terry, to <clears throat> add color around that, my understanding was that uh, if we go the, the payment facilitator route, which I would argue we have to go because I don't think we're going to get the comptroller to agree to let Tyler Technologies right manage a state of Texas account. Yeah. Um, would that require us to go through the process of, of basically getting new MIDs for everybody? It's a, it's a good question. There's, there's two ways that we could handle that. Um, if you go through the payment facilitator process uh, and we continue on with Chase, then I think we can continue to use the same merchant IDs that exist today. It hasn't been 100% confirmed, but we, but we think we're gonna be able to do that. Uh, if we switch over to the NIC uh, payment engine, which is part of that Texas.gov payment engine that was a requirement for the eFile Texas uh, program. I know there's uh, talks of, of the exemption there, but if we, if we go in that path, then yes, we would have to go in and procure new merchant IDs for every single cord. I think there's over 630 today uh, that are live. So we would have to do that for each one of those payment accounts. That's Tyler Technology presents NIC. Right. Right. Uh, what caused the uh, split to go from two to six times? Yeah, it's so, a great question. So Senate Bill 41 uh, required Tyler to collect the money and then disperse it directly to the recipient. And in the past, what was happening is Tyler was collecting all of the court fee and we were dispersing that directly to the county office. So either the DC, the CC or the JP office. And then that process was to collect those funds monthly. And then at the end of the month, do a disbursement out to the recipients, which there were four state accounts that, that were being dispersed out to. Senate Bill 41 says, we got to send that directly to those recipients. So we don't use the county as a collection group to then collect that money and do that monthly disbursement. We actually do that disbursement directly to those recipients as we're processing those transactions. And so that causes us to have to split those transactions up to the four state accounts, as well as the county account, and then the convenience fee uh, account that Tyler collects to cover the cost of processing those transactions. So it went from two to now uh, six, six different splits. And, and judge to add some uh, clarity around that, the other issue with that is the state accounting system does not have the ability to accept a single amount and split it amongst four accounts. It has to have this amount goes to this account. It can't handle all the splitting stuff. Yeah. Um, talking talking with the comptroller, they said they could put it on the list but wouldn't do it. We told them we'll pay you money, and they said that they still wouldn't do it. And so right. it, it was the route we had to go. I believe the system that they're using for the state accounting system is older than I. <clears throat> That means it's well tested. It's very well tested. <laughs> <laughs> Complete with a screen and a black background and green text. And has batch processing and JCL and all that other good stuff from history of computing. It installs a more County on their side because they get it as one and then they got to split it. So right. But that's what they are. <laughs> well, uh, Terry, what about, uh, I, I think we still have the issue, but I could be mistaken. 
Um, but we, what we found is, is that we're charging those six charges. If one failed, the, the transaction was still being accepted and we weren't getting all of our money. Has that issue been fixed? Tracy, I don't, I don't know. I wasn't, I wasn't aware of that issue, um, but I can certainly chase that down after the meeting. Okay, and I'll, and I'll ask my accounting department as well. Okay, that's great. Yeah, if that is an issue, let me, let me know, and and uh, if you've got details on it, that'll help me dig into it quicker. We definitely want to get that resolved if that truly is an issue. So one way to, I mean some way to maybe mitigate some of this is, is there any sort of notice that we're providing or anything on the website or something to pre-alert lawyers that you'll now be getting these six. kinds of six deals? Because I what I would envision is that they'd immediately put a hold on the credit card and nobody would get paid is what I would think that if they thought it was fraud. Yeah. So, right. so I think it would just behoove everybody to know ahead of time that, okay, you're going to now get, there's been a change, you're going to get six charges and, you know, put it on the website or what can we do to just let lawyers know that this is not fraudulent? Yeah, I, I, I think there's a few things that we can do. I think we can update our efiletexas.gov website to uh, to reflect that. I think we could also um, update the message of the day within the state provided filing portal, ask the electronic filing service provider partners uh, to do the same. And then we could also um, add a uh, notification uh, message to all of the notifications that are being delivered. So uh, which ones we add that messaging to, I think would probably want to work with, with Casey and his team on. Um, but th that would be things like the accepted message and the submitted message and, and those messages that are delivered when certain actions take, take place. But I think that's probably the best way to communicate that. The, the situation is obviously compounded if, uh, you know, there's a, um, a rejection or a return for correction, and then they turn around and then resubmit it. Um, you know, it obviously is 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 going through that process of dropping the hold and then reassessing that pre-authorization on those uh, transactions, which would essentially double those transactions uh, until the hold drops off. So we don't collect that money, but it does put a hold on during that pre-authorization. And so if if the time's right, it could actually even double those. So. It is a situation that I think we want to resolve as quickly as, as possible and still then be able to, to gain the efficiencies that, that we were able to realize with Senate Bill 41 and giving the money directly to the state. The other thing, Judge Simmons, that I'll, I'll tell you is that whenever, um, I believe it was the last winter conference I was at up in Denton, when we talked about Senate Bill 41, we made sure that the clerks were aware of this so that when they start getting calls from filers that they understood what was happening and it wasn't just complete and total mass confusion. Right. So I just, um, yeah, would strongly suggest that notification, I mean, all the notification you can give to lawyers to avoid them calling the clerks because that's a step they'll get frustrated by to avoid them canceling. All of a sudden there's double fees. So I cannot stress to you the need to get that kind of sorted and at least get some uh, some notices out. And frankly, if you've got some language, you know, we could send it to the different bar associations, to Dallas, Houston, San Antonio, and they'll just put it on their website. You know, just be alert. If someone can give us the language, we, we ought to send that out. Yeah. Yeah. We're doing be this happy to later this month and we want to be able to tell them. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we you do that. Seeing, doing. Yeah, we can do that. So um, I'll work with Terry and we'll get that language set up and then I'll make sure that everybody in JCIT has it so that um, whenever you guys are in touch with bars or have associations that you can feel free to say, here's here's the standard language that right. explains it. Yeah, not only that, I mean, I think we need a plan, right? right. So once you get that, I think we send it to all the, the certainly the top 10 bar right. groups in the top 10 cities. And then, you know, and then devolve from there and try and get people to spread it out to all their organizations. We'll put it in for the litigation site, the things I can control, like right, right. the San Antonio Bar, the litigation Absolutely. section, all that we'll try and do. But we just ought to really try and push it forward so, so that uh, we ameliorate this kind of issue. Well, what, and, and if you can add on the refund process to that too. Absolutely, we have to. Yeah, because we're finding that. We're having to refund multiple times for each state fee code uh, because they were charged multiple times. 
Because they didn't know what because they, they didn't understand what was well they I guess Tyler has to refund them each separately. Well no, we do. So there, there's a whole process now to where yeah. because the state funds are going direct to the comptroller, we have control over the state mids merchant IDs. Mm -hmm. And so there's a process now that if um let's say Dennis files something and wants a, a legitimate refund, we'll you know. Some people will say, well, I was charged six times, and then we explain it, and they say, okay, I understand. But if it was a legitimate refund, then they contact the local clerk. The clerk has the ability to refund the county portion. Once they do that, there's an email address the clerk just sends to this email address at OCA saying, I've refunded the county portion of this envelope number. Please refund the state portion. And then we go in and refund out of those four mids the same thing. Oh my God. Right. What a manual. Is, this, it, it just, is there not a more no no, no. automated? We, we could send them a check. And how much so when they typically what is the amount of the refund they're seeking? Yeah, it costs us more to refund. I mean, right. It just depends, it depends if it's a new case filing, it's $350. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's yeah. a big dollar. But I'm just saying, you know, emotion fears. I mean, I just, it would be horrible. If well, I mean, the, the volume that we have is manageable. Okay. Talk, talking to the CFO who is managing that process at OCA, okay. she says the cash flow of having the money arrive at the state right when it happens versus waiting four months after the fact is worth yeah. the effort to do handle refunds. So do, do, we don't know how long it's gonna take. Carrie, do we know Do we know what the limits are? Like it's not gonna happen in two weeks. Can we say it'll happen before 24 months? Is there some, some boundary we can set? Because it sounds like there's a lot of training and notification. And if y'all get this pay facility thing worked out in three months, they may just be finishing out the whole notification process as you've got a permit right. fix. Yeah, I, I I would say right. that it's, although not certain, I would say by the end of next year is probably the longest. I think once we get good clarity on the development changes, then we can work with Casey on prioritization on that. So what that would mean is if we accelerated that or, or prioritized it higher, and we would essentially then put that up front and then move out some of the eFile Texas 2.0 development work. We could certainly do that. What I don't have good clarity on is the regulatory requirements, all of those changes that really aren't technological. It's just the things that we need to, to go through to become a payment facilitator. We asked Chase if we were to just, what's what would prevent us from just getting an agreement with the state to say we could basically operate as a payment facilitator, stick that money into a Tyler account and do those disbursements without truly getting the designation of a payment facilitator. And they said that because we weren't the merchant or the end destination of those funds, that could potentially then result in us getting removed from a, a payment facilitator to be able to, to do that transaction as it is today. So obviously that's a, that's a much greater risk of not being able to take payment. So I think we got to go through the right process in order to get there. I just, we still don't have a good, uh, clear vision on, on what it's going to take in order to, to do that. I'll, uh, I'll continue to update this, this audience uh, with that as I get it. And then if, if this is something that we want to prioritize, then we can certainly work with, with Casey and his uh, team. To it just means the amount of outreach that Casey and the whole OCA is going to have to go through is, is substantial because... We always, it's always going to be substantial when we get into the further slides and start talking about e-file 2.0, you'll see that there are things already scheduled up through the end of next year. And so we add this on, then that pushes it into 24. And then well, if we get into I, 25 and 26, then 26, I'll, I, I'll train my successor, but then. I don't, I don't know what, what volume of problems are coming from the FSPs, but it seems to me that's a quick fix. If there's any substantial volume of refunds going through them. Yeah, I, and I, I think right now- I mean, you can hit think, them real quick, but I I think the refunds that OCA is getting, and I have to check with our CFO, but I think it's five or six a week okay. statewide. It's not an overwhelming amount. Okay. And every time I talk to her, she's like, no, I the, Seeing the money come into the state accounts right when it happens 
is so much more valuable than yeah. dealing with these five or six a week. The interest alone. Right. Uh, and, and Terry, I just checked with my team. We, we are still having issues every day balancing our e-filing registers because of this issue. So yeah, if you'll you'll send me details in an email, that'll that'll be helpful. Okay, we'll do. All right. Anything else on the Senate Bill Forty One update? Yeah, no, we just need probably that information. If you guys can work that out as soon as possible, sure. just to get it started out to the Texas bar even and just get them, because thank God virtually they can get a lot of this stuff out there to the lawyers. Sure. Got it. Okay, um, moving on, I'd like to just jump to eFile Texas 2.0 and give an update there. Uh, we're coming to the close on our first development cycle. Um, as you can see here, we've, uh, we've gotten through the uh, execution phase, which is the development portion. Now we're focusing on testing and training. User acceptance testing is expected to be complete here in the next couple of weeks on the 3rd of June, and then we will um, immediately kick off end user training uh, in the beginning of June for that particular cycle. Uh, we've got a production cutover date to make that information and or those features available on the 16th of July. And some notable enhancements that are included is our migration to uh, ECF 5.0, which is the new uh, national standard for uh, electronic court filing integrations, uh, bulk review actions for clerk, uh, incorporating chatbot help for support uh, for filers when they need it, um, enhanced machine learning uh, for redaction using uh, a, a more elaborate artificial intelligence mechanism, and then our e-file analytics, which I'll speak to uh, here in just a moment as we've, we've already begun the rollout of that solution. Our phase two is also underway, and, and we've already started that with development being about 50% complete, uh, and we've already begun the preliminary testing of the development functions uh, that we've already developed uh, there for that second cycle. So We'll continue to update the audience here uh, on our eFile Texas 2.0 uh, project as we continue to progress. In the first cycle, one of the, the major uh, development functions that we built was our new eFile analytics platform. That's really the reporting dashboard and, and tool that would allow for not only the state to see the metrics of the program as a statewide, but also then provide that local visibility for each of the individual clerks within their respective office so that they can manage the tool and their office uh, more efficiently. Um, with the rollout there, we've actually gotten through uh, four of the six implementation cycles. We've rolled it out uh, in a similar manner uh, to uh, the e-file rollout or the e-file mandate rollout, where we focused on the most populous counties uh, and then worked our way down. We've still got the counties that have a population of 20,000 to 50,000 uh, that's scheduled to go live on the 19th. And then we have our final phase, which is all of those counties. I think there's 136 that have a population of under 20,000 and that they'll go live on June 6th. Uh, so far, we've seen uh, really positive feedback on the tool and, and most specifically with regards to managing uh, the, the offices uh, for the clerks on a supervisory level. Um, things like being able to see how many envelopes are filed by specific case types, average response times for clerks when they're working those filings, and then the amount of return for correction or rejected filings, and then the reasons why uh, has allowed some of our, uh, our clerk offices and the supervisors there to be able to manage those offices more effectively. I think it gives us also visibility into some of the trends that we see across the state it highlights some of the outliers uh, when, we, when we do see those or problems uh, as we do see them in real time and then gives us an opportunity to dig in and, and identify maybe some areas where we can improve, uh, maybe not only in the tool, but also in the process. So uh, pretty excited to see this as it continues to get rolled out across the state. Uh, one uh, extra uh, talking point before we jump into a research update, we talked about um, our migration to the review tool, uh, which we did uh, late last year. Uh, in the last update, uh, we mentioned our EFSP, which is the state provided filing portal, and migration to our new tool, as well as migrating the entire program into the AWS GovCloud. 
uh, and it was asked that we provided an update here uh, at this meeting on those two initiatives. So uh, for our EFSP, we are targeting a redirect to the new tool at the end of July. It's about two and a half months away. Uh, we've already uh, started uh, crafting the outreach program, that campaign, which would contain eye contact messages, in-app notifications, uh, live and recorded training sessions, uh, new and existing user notifications, uh, which we which we talked a little bit about on the Senate Bill 41 uh, information. Uh, and then um, it, it would also include that redirect that points the uh, clerks um, to file into the new tools. So um, it, it, what we're waiting on right now is our next version of the EFSP is version 2022.5 goes into stage on the 23rd. So about 10 days from today, contains some um, usability improvements and then positions as well, I think for this migration. Uh, and then we will we will continue on uh, until we, we complete that migration. If you look at the volume now, we've got about two thirds of the filing volume going through our old filing portal. We've already got about a third of the filings going into the new portal. We should see those values start to, to, um, to, to change and, and almost become inverted, hopefully by the time uh, that we provide the next update and, and, and be in all the portion on the new filing program. For the EFM, uh, this is really the user community that's being impacted will be the third party integrators. It's really making sure that they have the right uh, IP addresses whitelisted and that they're pointed to the right environment. Um, we've been leveraging our EFM compass checks to inform our, inform our integration partners of important dates. Uh, and that's, that's been a, an avenue for uh, supporting the necessary uh, security change communications that would be required to make this uh, cutover. Our stage cutover is currently targeted for July 6th which should provide um, an ample runway for our integration partners to, to then perform the validation that's necessary before we, we actually make the migration in production uh, in mid-August. So um, it, in the event that we do encounter any issues during that migration, um, it's really just simply pointing back to um, our existing setup uh, today. So uh, it should leave uh, you know, a, a pretty good safety net there for us in the event that we do encounter any issues along the way. Any questions about the EFSP or, or EFM migrations? I'll just add to what Dennis said earlier. This is just more outreach. I mean, we're doing outreach for this. So it's just lots of communication, reminding everybody of dates. If, if, we can get some, if we can get, if it, if it changes a lot of the UI, if we can get some sort of uh, PowerPoint presentation or something that sure. we can put up on our website that would help the attorneys yeah. know that it's coming. And then as um, as Terry said, once they deploy this next version of it, Terry, we can get training materials that we can distribute to, for the clerks if they want to do uh, training materials for that new uh, EFSP, right? Absolutely. Yeah, the EFSP will really be the filing community as the primary stakeholders that will that will want that will be impacted by it. The EFM migration should be should be invisible to uh, the the end users. It's really around yeah, Tracy will know it. Yeah, that's right. That's right. But the the clerks and the and the filers they should. I, I, think, she, I think she's just wanting materials so that as we do the EFSP transition, that the clerks can post those training slides on their own website so that they can educate the filers as well. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and that'll be an important part of the process is, uh, you know, as a lot of the filers still rely heavily on the local clerk for guidance and, and direction. So being able to provide those um, training materials and, and using the clerks to help echo that message, I think will be an important part of the process. All right. Then, the, then last and, and, and finally, just a, a quick update on Research Texas. We continue to see the user community grow, uh, but, we, but we continue to hear really just two chief requests uh, coming from two different user communities, one from the clerk and then one from the legal professional community. Uh, the, the clerks really want to know when criminal data will be permitted uh, to be inside of research. I know right now, I don't think it's it's allowed. And so there are several counties who have 
observed the changes to document purchasing that were made as part of Senate Bill 41 and no longer see value in running their local system. So uh, because of that, that um, consistency across the pricing of documents uh, with the state provided solution with research in the local systems, um, they, uh, many of them have asked if they can retire their local public access systems and then just use research as the, as the primary system for their public access tool. Um, but but they're, they're kind of at a holding pattern until they can get the criminal records in because that's, that's the piece that they're missing in order to, to, to overcome that. So we've heard this from uh, places like Bear and Oasis and Navarro and, and Hill and, and, and several others. So um, I think that's an important part to, to make the migration there as well as reducing the expense of managing their local systems uh, for the clerks. And then the legal professional community uh, they continue to uh, ask about uh, comprehensive records, specifically around judgments and orders. Um, I think this just reinforces the importance of that subcommittee that Carlos is, is leading for us. So um, other than that, I think it's uh, continued upward progression in terms of users uh, of, of research, which is a positive thing. So do we need to make a recommendation to the justices for those counties to remove the notice that we've agreed to put on the bottom of all these forms saying this is not an official record? For them, it would become their official record, right? No, uh, it, it's still a copy. Yeah, because you still have to pay to go get the official record. It's just you're not, they're not distributing, it's not coming from them. It's so instead of going to Williamson County, they're, or still going to have or somebody, they're not turning off their public access completely. They're turning off their local public access and then integrating. So you see like uh, John Warren's a great example of it. His CMS still controls and houses all okay. the documents. Research just says, hey, I need this document from this case. Yeah. And then his okay. CMS hands it out. Research charges the fee and gives it back. A, a ton of counties started using that as their public portal. Okay. If you go call in and right. I mean, I forgot the other ones when I was researching this before to see who was doing what. And they had tons of them had gone to research. Yeah. Okay. Now, that doesn't mean they give it up for free. They right. may use it and then they, you know, okay. they, they still charge. So. But to Terry's point, what it does is if I'm a county and I'm used to running, you know, two servers and software and managing all that. Yeah, makes sense. Then I can turn all that off and use this. That the state's picking the dime up for, and it doesn't impact my revenue. Um, I do think on criminal is a, is a good point. I know that we've made JCIT has passed recommendations. Yeah. So yeah. I think we can work together offline to make sure that. I think the court has that, right? I think they do, yeah, but I so don't I, know I, that they I, do. I'm we can we can work to ones. see where, we can where that come is. Back and double check. Yeah, yeah, yeah and talk to them. But I mean, I think we reported reach. that. Yeah, I think we're. I know that JCIT's done with it. We do, yeah, right. We did whatever we were going to agree to and sat down with. Yeah, and then um, okay. and judgments and orders. I know that Carlos and Todd uh, will will talk about that in a moment. I, as far did as the integration status, do what? I didn't think we finalized the criminal. Yeah, we did. Remember, we said you had to do all this stuff up front that says basically, are you sure oh, yeah, yeah. that this doesn't right. contain sensitive data? Yeah, are you sure you're sure? Yeah, yeah. That, that was pre COVID. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure? it was. I think that's, I think that's <laughs> the problem. Yeah. Right yeah. There's a giant cloud that kind of interferes into everything that we did. Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> so is now the time to bring up the. Um, and I'll bring this up because I have you on the line. So we've had a, a, a and, and I don't know, I don't know if this is a system problem, a lawyer problem, or what. But basically, apparently, on the um, on just the e-filing, so uh, Judge Roy Ferguson has brought this to our attention that there are lawyers and they're filing like show cause things. There are certain. There's certain types of service that must be done in person for things like show cause, for things like garnishment and stuff like that. You serve process kind of like you would um, like, like writ of attachments. It's, it's, in, it's done in person, it's done through a constable, sheriff or whatever, right? You have to have personal service. Well, there's some 
lawyers that apparently are checking the box for service, then putting in the address of the individual for the e-filing service, and that is their completion of the, you know, contempt hearing service or whatever, instead of doing a, a, a writ. So, so I don't know if that's lawyer confusion. I don't think it's confusing at all that the, that that you can't use rule 21 because there are other rules that pertain to those specific processes. So, um, but what happens is it's just so easy to say, let me check the service box. Oh, address? Well, let me put the client, the individual, which they shouldn't be doing at all because they're represented by counsel. Um, I, I think that's a lawyer education thing. I, think it is. I, I, I don't know if there's... I don't know if it warrants a little footnote that says, you know, there's other kinds of service, check the rules, or I don't know how much of a problem this is, or if this is only happening in certain venues. And I, I saw courts. Judge Ferguson join the meeting, so. Hey, are you on Judge Ferguson? I'm here, I'm here. You described it correctly, and I did reach <laughs> out to other judges to find okay. out if this was one-off. And other people are doing the same thing. Where I saw it was in a contempt hearing uh, where they were asking for a finding of contempt and incarceration. And of course, there must be personal service or contempt is not on the table as a, as a remedy. I said, I have reviewed the file and there's no personal service. Contempt is not available. They came back to me, and these are two good lawyers, agreeing that there was service through EFA. And it actually threw me enough that I reached out to, uh, to Justice Simmons to say, am I wrong on this? What am I missing? But this is happening elsewhere because of the word serve and the fact that the rules allow certain service through e-file. They've just mixed those together and they believe if you check serve, that counts the same as certified mail would count for some kinds of service. So my suggestion was, is there any way to put something that says, you know, par parenthetically, this is not personal service. You know, this is rule 21A service or notice or whatever the, the smarter people than me want to say. But that is a dispositive misunderstanding based on the word serve. Yeah, it just, it, I think that there is uh, confusion around uh, when electronic service is an acceptable form of service and when personal service is needed. I think the, the, the rules spell that out, um, but, but it may not always be as clear uh, when practicing. I think, um, you know, also I think that, you know, the attorneys are sometimes not the ones who are using the system. Sometimes they have, um, uh, you know, some other staff that's yeah, using yeah. Them and they may get confused there too. One thing that we could do is, is put some context around that section within the application. We have tools that would allow for us to basically add comments there, uh, instructions, if you will, uh, that, would, that would only be available within the state provided portal. Every electronic filing service provider would, would need to do something similar within their own respective tool. But that's certainly something that we could add if we have the right verbiage of of what to add there. So, okay, so 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 you all could do the state one, but it wouldn't transfer over to the other EFSPs or no. the other providers. But we do have contact with them all. Yeah, so we could just say if JCIT said, "Here's the language," we yeah. could ask them all, "Can you please add this language so that we can reduce this misunderstanding of the difference between." electronic service, which is acceptable in some uh, well, cases. Well, it's rule 21. Right. I mean, the thing is, the they, is they just need to go, look, the, the e-file rules and the service relating to e-filing is all done through rule 21. If you look at show cause, there's completely different rules and statutes about person, and they talk about personal service, which in a different context. So I think we could put um, just a one-liner almost that this is rule 21 service and does oh, not apply, you know, that other statutes and rules may have a, you know, a personal service, service requirement and, and maybe even change it to a, you know, because they may think personal service is e-filing. I, you know, let, 
we can think of that. I just need to review all of those rules because we can think of the correct language, I think, right. and it can be short, but it needs to be clarified, it sounds like. One, and once it's clarified, we're happy to distribute it. And make sure I don't know how many there. document types we have, but isn't there some way to check a flag on the document type? And if we see a combination of this, sorry, Pete, work for your Bob. And, and, but and, if we and see and this document type and this service request, then the EFSP or the EFM can say, no. you're not allowed to do this. I, my only concern is that I know there's and it would be at the filing type level, and we have filing types that say no fee documents. Right. And so that's such a broad category of things. It would be things. really hard then to. It would be well, hard to. And you to may decide. want to serve the attorney, right, yeah. with just notice, right, right, like your normal right. notice, right. but recognize that you have to get personal service on the actual person. So, so you may not want to preclude that service from going out to the other but you just want to know that you're not satisfying the rules by checking this right. box. Yeah. it's just a standard message that's displayed over and over eventually people don't see it it's just gone it's not there anymore sure and i but i i see that maybe the only way to educate on say if you're asking for this it's not going to happen in your what if we just said does not does not meet requirements for personal service right we could add language. I mean, the reality in e-file two later on down the road, in well, in additional services today, you can say, I want this to be served by the sheriff, but you can request personal service. And then further down in e-file two, we'll have ways that those personal service providers can integrate and start doing it that well, way. I remember we put that in. But uh, yeah, I, I think all we can do is put messages out and hope that the attorneys read them and take them to heart and abide by the rules. It does not meet requirements for personal service yeah. required. One comment on all this is uh, somewhere uh, close to 50% of all civil cases filed in justice court are not attorney represented. Yeah. And so when they're trying to do e-filing, they may be getting messed up by, by this because it's unclear on how the service is being interpreted. So for instance, eviction filings, uh, small claims, most of those are gonna be filed uh, without attorney representation. Right. So in that case, Judge, we need to make sure that the language reflects something that a non-attorney person would understand this is not the box that you need to check. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I have a yeah. quick comment. Uh, uh, I was just going to suggest it sounds like this function is basically for items that can be served in accordance with Rule 21. So right. just say something. This only applies to items that can be served via Rule 21 because you've got you got your your rules and I forget if it's 103, 106 and they're on for personal service uh, of process and so forth. And then you got for your post-judgment writs, personal service requirements right. there and everything. And we start trying to list all the ones where you have to do personal service. We're probably going to miss it. Um, I think show cause orders, uh, the case law is absolutely crystal clear that you have to have personal service there. But I'm not sure that there's an actual specific rule uh, that says so. It's it's kind of a due process thing. I could be wrong on that, but it might be just easier to say this only only applies to things that uh, you can serve electronically via Rule Twenty One. Yeah, that's what I would do. That and uh, Rule Twenty One, you know, and you could even put just just to slap them in the face with it that other rules and statutes may apply. <laughs> you know, without putting it all down. But anyway, I think this is a problem that it sounds like, thank you, Judge Ferguson, for bringing it to our attention. Um, this is something that we probably need to work on this language. Is there anybody that wants to volunteer to work on this and just get, I mean, I think it needs just to be a short, sweet, like if we can get it in one sentence, that would be great. Don't everybody volunteer at once. Yeah, hey, because, you know, I love to a point. Let me look to see who's here. Uh. 
I feel like this is partially my fault, so I'll be happy to participate. Okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll work with I'll work with you. On, um, uh, no, I am just so glad somebody brought it to our attention before it just kind of catches on like wildfire. Um, so why don't we work on that and try by the next meeting to have that language um, available so we can go ahead and get moving on that. Yeah. And I think, you know, uh, and, and as we work on it, I don't know, Judge Ferguson, what the best way just to alert the judges that this might be going on, or do we want to do that? Or do you want to take care of that? Or what do you, what do you think? We can certainly address that in September at the annual meeting. Oh, yeah. The okay. Attended. Um, yeah. Okay. It could be that the sections would help us. For example, the family law, I'm on family law council. Maybe they would put something in their update e-blast okay. uh, warning people. Uh, so we'll, yeah. I'll make that part of our task and, and see what we can do to spread the word a little bit. Yeah, if we could get just a little bulletin, then we can spread it around to the different, you know, uh, bars, you know, the family bar, the, the litigation section, TTLA, all those guys and just kind of say, hey, you know, here's the reminder. Sounds good. Okay. All right, that's an action item. There. Yep, I got it. Okay, thank you. Okay, Terry, keep on Sorry, going. Sorry, Terry. No, that's, that's good. I think that was my last slide for the update. So happy to address any questions that may be present. All right, any other questions for Tyler? So, um, one of the things I had a question about on the redaction and who's picking up on the redaction, do we have some percentage of the number of, I don't know how, what would your percentage of, the number of filings that have, where they've utilized the redaction? I'm just trying to think from the big picture overall, how many filings are people actually doing this, running it through the redaction process? Yeah, I, I don't have the types of filings that they are are using the redaction tool on in front of me, but that's that's definitely information that we can that we can get. That'll give us better visibility into which types of filings they are uh, using the tool on more more frequently. Yeah, it's, and it's not only that; it's just when I was taking my notes down, and you mentioned, oh yeah, it's increasing, it's increasing. So, what percentage out of total filings has redaction been used? Got it. Yep, I can I can pull that information for you. And do we have a percentage of, you know, I know in family law for a time period up at the top of their proposed forms, every single one of them had contains confidential information that would require it not to be in the e-file system. Do we have any idea, is anybody keeping track of the statistic on how many filings, what percentage of filings just are off the bat, not in the research system? Well, but there's a whole list of documents for family that can't be put. That's true, that's true. That's, I'm just trying to think of yeah, ones, ones yeah. that have used the, the you know, contains confidential information. And I recognize that there's a huge batch that shouldn't be anyway, but I was just curious otherwise. I think we could be able to find out the documents or the things that don't get trans that came through e-file that didn't show up in research. Yeah, correct. And we can find that. The issue is going to be things that come across the counter. And can you? We're not going to be able to see that. Can you segregate out? Can you segregate out? Okay, family. I don't want to know about the family law cases, by case type. In other words, what yes. case types? Yeah. What case types are do we find predominantly? It'll be family to start with. I just want to know how how much info does research contain? Because if everybody's sticking confidential, because it's an easy way to get around Rule seventy six and having to deal with, you know that. Then, then I just want to know. Right, we can get that information. Yep, we'll pull those statistics. All right. Uh, the next item on the agenda is an update on our uh, OCA's UCMS system, and I'll give that update. Uh, Davin Greeno is on our staff as our our project manager for that project. 
As you all know, we've got uh, two different vendors, iDocket and Tyler Technologies, um, providing case management systems to counties for uh, under 20,000 or 20,000 and under. Uh, both vendors are working feverishly to bring up their early adopter county and both have them identified. Uh, we expect within the next few months to have the Texas standard configuration for each of those products completed and approved by OCA so that um, once the vendor has the Texas standard, then they can start rolling out everybody else that's on their list. Um, right now, the list that we've got, um, we know that um, they're each roughly have about 20 counties on the list that are going to participate and that there's an additional waiting list after that uh, because like we're first wanting to get people that are not using that product already. So if you're not using iDocket, if you're not using Odyssey, then we can go ahead and bring you on. But now we've got waiting lists of iDocket customers that are using on-premise iDocket that want to go to the cloud. We have on-premise Odyssey users that want to go to the state offering and move to that contract. And so uh, we're working with them to get those on board as well. But when we're done, um, like I said, with the research integration and e-filing integration being a requirement, those numbers will continue to go up so that our smaller counties are also getting service with research integration and um, e-filing integration. The other nice thing is it also does uh, integration with DPS and their criminal history. Usually what happens in our smaller counties is that there's a website that the clerk has to go to and physically keying in criminal dispositions. Um, whereas like in Tracy's shop, I'm pretty sure she's got the batch functions to DPS enabled so that they just upload a file once a night to DPS with all the criminal dispositions for the day. And so now the smaller counties participating in this program will get to leverage that as well. So um, we're, like I said, we're expecting by the end of uh, first quarter next year to have, you know, between 20 and 30 counties on the system. And then moving ahead, that number is only going to continue to grow. So that is moving along as well. So I, you said something that surprised me a little bit. You said some present iDocket counties are thinking of converting to their cloud. I think you were suggesting they were equivalent. The cloud <laughs> customer paid version and the version we're creating for UCNS is the same software. Right? It's the same software. One is hosted in my data center, managed by my, my contract IT staff in the county versus this other one, which OCA pays for, that is hosted by the vendor and my IT staff don't take care of it. It's just the vendor. Mm -hmm. So when, when cloud started marching out, IT, IT people thought, this is great. I'm going to save a ton of money and no one ever saved money going to the cloud. But what, what, what they're finding is now with cybersecurity, you've got to grade every piece of hardware you've got. And the more pieces of hardware you get at your data center, the easier it is to secure your organization. So everybody wants to get rid of old green screens, old yep. equipment, old yep. equipment. Um, and so... I, I, I can't imagine there will be many counties left in five years running their own hardware for anything that they can put in the cloud right. just because. Or state agencies for that matter. Yes, because it's the risk is so high. Oh. It's, in our pain, they're, they're field, right? They don't want to change that. What? They're, they're, we just talked about their green screen payment oh, and all that, yeah. right? Comptroller, I don't yeah, work for them, so I can't it, it, There are some departments and some functions that love to embrace old equipment and that actually turns out when it's really really old that's great because the russian hackers don't know what it's, the hell to do with 1980s exactly. uh, right. uh mainframes yeah. but i suspect that march is going to become a gallop yeah. among most of the counties very shortly just because yeah. you can't get a cyber review with a bunch of old equipment you just can't there's no right. way and so everybody's dumping their old stuff. And if indeed this platform is functionally similar to what conventional people are running, you're going to see a lot of them embracing it. Yeah. And I think um, 
OCA's general position is we want to uh, get as many counties on so that we can make sure that the money that we've been allocated for this project is completely used up. And so I think we'll, we'll be able to achieve that and up to where we can say there's even more demand to the legislature that this helps things in lots of ways. Good job. That's good. All right, any other questions on UCMS? If not, the next item, uh, I'll turn it over to, I think, I, I know I saw Todd. I don't think, I think Carlos had mentioned that he had a, yeah. he had a hearing that he, he thought might be done, but might not. And then so instead of Carlos, we have Todd to talk about orders this morning. So Todd. That's right, yeah, Casey. I'm sorry to disappoint you all that I'm not Carlos Soltero, but uh, yeah, Carlos had a docket call this morning that has run long. And so, uh, and I, like Terry, I'm headed out of town this weekend. So I apologize that I couldn't be there in person. Uh, just on the order subcommittee, we just have a couple of quick points of update. Uh, the committee has continued to meet uh, and I'm pleased to report that uh, we're making, I think, significant progress on the issue of um, proposed orders. You know, as you may recall, we have really sort of two items on our agenda, two things that we're charged with. One is the process for getting, uh, for dealing with proposed orders. You may remember that uh, there had been some confusion with proposed orders when the automated certificate of service was attached. And then if a court were to sign the order and send it back, then there, uh, it was causing uh, some confusion at some level on when the order was signed and, uh, and so forth. And so uh, the committee, I believe, uh, has come up with a potential solution on that issue. And that uh, is, and we'll, we'll credit our discussions specifically with Tracy and, and John Warren uh, for this, that, um, and I believe Casey was going to check with Tyler about the idea of having the uh, document title show up in the automated certificate of service up until now that has not been happening all we had was the, the reference reference number or the uh, envelope number and so now if if it's a technological solution that is as simple as uh, incorporating the the data field that describes the document <clears throat> excuse me into the automated certificate uh, then there really isn't going to be any dispute or any reason for confusion any longer uh, at least with uh, to the extent that the document description is, is adequate. And so um, the committee had a really good discussion on this in, in our latest meeting uh, earlier this week. And I think we're subject to further discussions with Tyler. Uh, I think we're headed in a, in a very positive direction on the automated certificates from the standpoint of uh, avoiding having to uh, code proposed orders differently within the system so that they show up with an automated certificate of, or not. Uh, there was some concern about uh, starting down that path of turning on or off the feature of, of an automated certificate of service in a document that was truly filed with the court. Uh, I think you know we're, we're, we're keeping the, the view open that at some point in time, there may be a rule change uh, that essentially replaces the uh, obligation to uh, certify service on the other side and that this automated uh, certificate of service may lead to that. And so we're just trying to avoid uh, creating problems later on down the road. Uh, and this, this does seem like a, a solution to that problem. And I think, you know, the, the clerks on our committee were satisfied with it. If they have anything to add uh, to what I just said, I'd certainly invite, uh, I know Tracy and John were very involved in that discussion. I would certainly invite them to contribute to the discussion here today. And I, I have a question uh, just to make sure I understand. So so when a judge says, okay, submit submit an order, okay, and tells the parties, okay, we've had our hearing, and sometimes tells both of them, go submit an order, whichever one of them, of course, is going to submit they want, and the other one is, you know, going to submit they want or whatever. Those get submitted. Um, so what, what title would that be submitted on that would distinguish it from the court's order? So um, what what the committee has proposed and 
Todd, I, I do have my late breaking update from Tyler. I spoke with them yesterday about it and they said it's a very short lift that they could get it in with e-file two later on this year. And so it's really not that big of a deal. But so the proposed order would have a field that says the filing type. And so it would say, you know, Rebecca Simmons with your bar number filed this proposed, and it would say proposed order. And then whatever you type in is the filing description, you know, proposed order for whatever, whatever would show up on that service. And so if I were opposing counsel, the judge would also see a different proposed order that also says this is a proposed order from Casey Kennedy, bar number, whatever, whatever, and whatever I put in for it so that you can match that certificate of service up with that particular document in a heck of a lot easier way than the, today. All you get is just an envelope number, which we know that judges don't have the time to go and dig to see, well, what envelope does this go to? And what right. was this? And, and then if they sign the order, then it's then the certificate of service says this was served for the proposed order. And then you know it's not for the order. For the actual side. order. That's right. right. That's right. So are we relying on lawyers, however, to put in proposed order? Are we relying on them to do proposed? Because yes. they, they and they do that today. They but some don't because what they want is just submitting the order that the judge said, bring me an order. And so it's an order granting summary judgment or it's an order doing this. And it doesn't say proposed. It they, just says order. If they file electronically, they would pick this is a proposed order, order as a okay. filing As time. opposed to order. Correct. Correct. There is no order towards. For the file. So order is not. Oh, that's okay. Files. Thank you for taking care of that. <laughs> yes. You know, we have to make this we don't idiot, the file idiot order. proof, right? Yeah. Because if a lawyer says, okay, I guess this is the order because the judge said bring the order. So let me check order. Okay. Yeah. That's not even an offer. It's proposed order. Correct. Okay. Okay. I, I just want to make sure that this was. You know, right. but you, you make it sound like half the lawyers are below average. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> oh, no, no, it's not but, that. It's just I can see them or they're paralegals or they're oh, totally. people right. getting confused. That's sure. all I'm saying. The, the only thing that we have, if it's something that y'all can help last to the whole state, is that when they do put in that document title, it's automatically defaulted to their file name. So it could say A1F.PDF. And if they don't change it. And if it, they don't change it to say this is a proposed order for XYZ, uh, then there's a then there's a huge problem because then the clerks change it, but in that automated certificate of service, is it going to say A1C.pdf? I that that may be a Terry question. And Terry, we may want to take that back to Evan of when the automated certificate of service is generated. Is it using what the clerk put in to accept? Or is it using what the filer put in? But we can chase that down. Yeah, check Yeah, there's clearly going to be uh, some implementation issues, but I I think we all you know, sort of had a revelatory aha moment when we realized the simplicity of the solution. Um, I think we were all, you know, everyone who was participating in this discussion, and we did not have a full subcommittee. A representation uh, just because of conflicting schedules but um this is one of those where it's like the it, we're super happy that the solution seems to be one that's super simple technologically and that it's the, the members represented on the subcommittee could very easily uh, reach agreement on and so um i think our suggestion now is just to continue to pursue this with tyler and of course we we would expect that there will be further questions that come up and I, I, Justice Simmons, I think those are good questions that you ask. We, we definitely want to make this as streamlined as possible, uh, like has been the case with, with so many of the things that we've worked on. So, um, but I think Carlos and I are, are pleased with where this is headed. And I think ultimately, you know, gosh, if it's going to be something that can be rolled out, you know, later this year, that would be a win, uh, for us as a committee. Um, barring any further questions or comments on that, we also, our committee has also been working on the, the ongoing issue of how to get signed orders into research. Uh, this is something that we haven't made quite as much progress on. We discussed this at length at the last meeting. Um, where we left off was some potential uh, rule revisions. 
And I think where we are headed with this ultimately is to get uh, the Supreme Court rules attorney involved in the discussions to see, you know, how far we can go with with rules changes to address the issues that uh, that we're facing, which primarily is just as simply as I described it, is just to, to make research really what it, it should be and uh, the most useful for the end users uh, that, that orders need to be in in that uh, database. Um, the Supreme Court, we, we discovered recently that one of the revision, one of the rules that we were talking about uh, seeking revisions on to account for electronic uh, notice, that's 306A3, uh, the Supreme Court has already made a revision to that rule that somewhat helps us uh, because it does specifically provide in a, in a new version that went into effect uh, earlier this month on May 1st, it does ex expressly permit the notice uh, to all parties electronically. Uh, it still it, it contains the language that, that notice could be mailed. And so where we were heading as a committee was to try and and steer that rule toward a, a preference for sending notices electronically. Uh, there are other rule changes that we're still working on as an ongoing project. And I, I do think that sort of where we are with uh, getting orders into Research Texas is to continue to discuss those rule changes, especially in light of now we're having to, the, the goalpost has moved a little bit on 306A. And so we're gonna have to make an adjustment with respect to that rule. And we still have some other proposed rules that we wanna work through. Um, but I think we would sort of like the um, full committee's blessing to uh, reach out to the, the Supreme Court rules attorney uh, to see if we can start the process or at least figure out what we need to do to um, put these in a form that where they could be presented ultimately to the Supreme Court. Uh, the, the tricky part with 306A, the, the new amendment is the rule was just amended, so we may need to be looking at other solutions because I, I don't know that the Supreme Court is going to be as inclined to amend a rule that it just made some changes to. Uh, so we're, we're continuing to have productive discussions when it comes to getting orders into Research Texas, but um, it, would, it would be great for us if we, if we truly have solved the problem with automated certificates of service, then we can focus 100% of our subcommittee's attention on getting rules in research and move on from there. Do we have any follow-up questions or comments from anyone? Yeah, I think the next step, I'm sorry, Todd, I was kind of looking at what the Supreme Court has done because part of it is I need to recheck it. And this is for Judge Ferguson too. They may have changed some of the personal service to uh, Rule 21A service. So we just need to double check that if, if Judge Ferguson's still on the line and look at that. Um, so on the rules, because these, what's, what's concerning me is a lot of these counties that are moving to basically research Texas to use kind of as their public document display, right? That's what they're going to use. That, mm -hmm. that without the orders, you know, it becomes very difficult to figure out what's going on. And so, you know, I think at some point we really have to push forward and figure out that process on those orders so that it is just compulsory somehow that that and, and figure out an easy process where that just works out that way. Um, but I think this is a great start and that we probably need to talk to the Supreme Court rules, you know, the rules attorney kind of to, to start working and definitely working with the clerks and stuff because we don't want to overburden them somehow with this. But. Well, and, right. and Judge, the other thing to keep in mind too is that ultimately there's three paths in. You can either upload documents manually, which nobody wants to do. Right. Um, you can integrate with research, which I know John Shop has done, Collin County. There's right. people who have done that, so that's fine. Um, and then the committee, last time we were talking with Tracy, and I, I'll talk with Tyler to see if there's anything other special APIs that would just allow orders only rather than uh, full integration that we can possibly do to, to make that. But ultimately, absent of, or once we provide those pathways in, then I think it may end up being the committee basically recommending that 
that the local jurisdictions are eventually going to have to pick. You know, here are the three pathways in, and the Supreme Court say you shall do this and pick one of these three paths and go. Yeah. Okay. And then just kind of have a time period within right, which we much like we did with the filing. Way. And yeah, and the nice thing much. is, is that absent Harris County, I know that Dallas County, Collin County, Denton County. Um, are all fully integrated with research El Paso. So a lot of the bigger ones are already there. And I know talking with Tracy, they would be there if they had the slim down integration piece as well. So I, I do think at some point we're gonna get to like we did with E5 and where we've done the, the group that can do all it can do and now it's it's up to the court to say let's move forward and, and do it right we just need to give a recommendation oh absolutely now. so i mean absolutely. that's the thing we right. need to say what is our recommendation and i think that's really where we look to the committee kind of yep. to um uh, do that and we did have a conversation with justice boy just right. on what they were looking for in terms of this so um and he was he was helpful so uh so I think, you know, we'll just continue on, Todd, and we'll, you know, right. I don't know how, um, how we can support you with those, of, you know, with meeting dates and things like that in terms of kind of moving forward to figure out what exactly that recommendation is going to look like. But, um, but anyway, good work on the, I like the proposed order revision that really should help um, clarify that situation. Well, in the meantime, feel free if anyone has any ideas or concerns, uh, feel free to reach out to me or Carlos directly, and we'll be organizing another meeting of the subcommittee and and uh, opening some discussions with uh, Jacqueline, the, the Supreme Court rules attorney, to see if we can continue to move this forward. Okay, that sounds good. Okay, um, all right. So let's see, we have some old business to talk about recommendations regarding the flow of sealed documents through the e-filing system. So Judge, you'll recall at our last meeting, you had asked, what, do the federal, what does the federal government do in this case? Because PACER uh, and the, the feds allow sealed documents to go through. In reading what the feds do, and then um, I think Judge Hine is still on and is familiar as well with the federal system, can speak a little bit to it, but that what it, the feds end up doing is, is basically you file a motion, you're filing a motion to file a sealed document electronically. And then once the judge approves that motion, then you're able to file the document electronically. And that's that's how the feds handle that. Is that correct, Judge Hahn? I can't say that that's across the board. Uh, a particular federal case I'm involved in right now, that's the way the judge is requiring it. Um, but anecdotally, I've heard in other federal cases uh, that, and I should confirm with my legal assistant, that you can just file something under seal without getting the pre-approval. Um, and, you know, that's, <clears throat> those of us who've been trial judges uh, in state court and have to deal with rule 76A, a frustration has always been that there's these form protective orders that go around for what to do when you're filing confidential documents and they have, they assume they keep, you can just file them if they're designated confidential. Problem is Rule 76A doesn't allow that in state court. You've got to get a at least a temporary sealing order, if not a permanent sealing order, first. And so um, most of those form protective orders that people have been using for years really probably grow out of some standardized protective orders that the federal courts issue as part of, in some cases, the bankruptcy local bank not local patent rules. And so that's why I say anecdotally, I think it's it's actually a lot easier in the federal court, but I don't have any, my only experience right now is with a particular federal judge that 
requires us to get an order first before we can actually file under seal. Uh, so that's not that's not really helpful. That's just kind of where I'm at. <clears throat> so there, there are occasions I can recall in filing cases in federal court where it involved probably an, an intellectual property case, a patent case. But basically, you know, tons of the exhibits were all filed under seal. And, and I mean, no motion or anything else. It was just, and there were actually standard, and I think there's one in the Western District, standard protective orders that basically require, and you don't alert anybody because they don't have the same considerations. So they just went into a PACER and it said they were sealed. Um, and um, and you just put the, the, the language on it. And I don't know, you know, I don't know. Their system seemed very robust in terms of that did not appear on PACER. Right. right. You know what I mean? It, it, so, and, so. and I'll let Terry speak to the technological side of it. My understanding is that, that the technology to file documents, seal documents exists today in our e-filing system. It's just currently not configured for our state because we don't allow, by rule, don't allow documents to be sealed. Is that correct, Terry? We do have access to that? You do. It's just a configuration setting that that we're not using in the state of Texas. There are other states that do allow sealed records to be electronically filed, but then obviously suppressed and not not made available on public access. So that functionality is is present. It's just a configuration setting that we would have to work with you to to enable. Right. So I guess the question is, is that something that we want to pursue? I know our, initially when the rule was written, there was a discussion on or the concern was revolving around if a document was sealed and coming in through e-filing, through the clerk review queues, even with it flagged and, and the clerks told, this is a sealed document that somehow that would end up in public access. And I don't know if, if John or Laura or any of the clerks would like to speak to that just from the standpoint of that may not be the concern today. Hey, or how are your yeah go ahead Th this is john i i can tell you all that the uh i'm also on the uh supreme court's advisory committee and uh we're actually having uh, discussions regarding the 76a already yeah yeah there, i i know you all are already having that let me ask you john how do you treat your sealed documents when someone comes in and files it and it's in a manila envelope and it's a hard copy and they file it what do you all do with it we do not ingest that sealed document into any system. We basically just maintain that envelope, uh, Justice Simmons, and we wait until there's been a decision by the judge with regard to it being sealed or unsealed. And so you just keep them in a, like in a, in a filing cabinet or something? Or yes. a, I mean, it, and it could have a lock. I don't I mean, it just, in other words, just yeah. maintained like in the old days paper document. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Do you all do, is that what you all do, Tracy? If I don't think they, they file sealed documents today. No, 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 over the counter. I over mean, the counter. Oh, over the I counter. hand you this is my sealed document. Here's my sealed document. What do you all do with those? Do you we, know? we, in our imaging system, we have security levels. And so when imaging images that document, they're automatically sealed. That's what I'm saying. You so all they, image. I so mean, they open the, open the middle envelope and the images. So I don't right. understand that. That's oh. what concerns. I mean, but only clerks and, and well, judges have well, access to those sealed documents. Right. And only some clerks. Oh, okay. All. Okay. But you I come think up, Rebecca, you... Rebecca, if I recall, it's been a few years now, unfortunately, my clerk would bring the envelope to me. Say, okay. and that, I may be confusing that with in-camera submissions, but uh, yeah. they would yeah. bring it to me. Mm -hmm. um, well, no, because I was able to look at things that I had ordered sealed mm -hmm. in the electronic database um, so it, it's hard to recall, but I think kind of what Tracy's kind of hinting at is at least in Harris County with six, 60 district judges and, uh, I forget if it's 15 or 16 County criminal court at law judges that, you know, are serviced by the district clerk. Uh, you have a variety of workflow, um, possibilities depending on the, 
the peculiarities of the judge and the peculiarities of the particular lead assistant clerk for that court. Um, so it's hard to say how it's done uniformly. Judge, I if, I, if I can ask, uh, if, if I can ask, so if um, if the judge denies the um, <laughs> um, the attorney's request to file it under seal, and the attorney decides that he wants to withdraw that particular document, then so and I know um, um, in Harris County they're scanning them. Uh, so what do you do if 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 the attorney decides he wants to withdraw that particular document? Well, what usually would happen, you get a motion. For say it's we're not in the middle of like a trial or a hearing and someone mm -hmm. orally moves for temporary sealing but it's it's beforehand and uh you have to file a motion for temporary sealing order and if it's opposed because that's really probably one of the only situations where the judge is going to get in the way and perhaps deny it say it's opposed the movement isn't actually attaching the exhibit to their motion for temporary sealing. They'll mm -hmm. set a hearing or they will submit it for in-camera submission. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> if it's submitted with in-camera submission, the practice of me and the judges I knew is once I was done with the documents that were submitted to me in camera, in camera mm -hmm. I'd give it back to the clerk. Say, call the lawyer who submitted this and tell him to come get it. Yeah, oh, and, uh, I'm, and that's that's a practice that I'm familiar with. But with Harris County, Tracy's saying that they scan the document. Well, that's we, if it's sealed. We would, right, we would only scan it if the judge says this is sealed. But if the okay. judge, okay. if the judge, okay. and it's also person. marked. It, it's it's going to have right. a different security group and how it's marked. In Hidalgo County, yeah. we mark them as confidential, so only the judge has access. Right. Okay. Yeah. And the, so and the other sure. situation where we have the hearing, the lawyer brings it to me, shows it to me. And because I'm sensitive, I don't want, you know, you can't put the genie back in the bottle. Uh, we'll talk about, okay, how are we going to figure this out while you can preserve your rights? Um, you know, I can give it back to you if the confidentiality is more important than the use of that document for the merits of the particular issue in front of me. Or you know, how do you want to do this? And 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 we we work that out. I'm curious though, uh, and this I should know this, but what are we doing with juvenile filings? Since those are, I thought presumptively confidential. Those are those have not. I mean, we ex originally even excluded those from yeah. filing. So and now nice. we file, but they're all completely nobody gets to see them. Right, I mean, that's what uh, I thought. Yeah. I mean, are they sealed by default? Well, nobody seals them. Of, I mean, yeah. do they? I and papers, just not... They just file them by paper. They file it. They, there's they're electronically filed. Not so in we never They are. The, the DA, they, they will be processed through the system. I mean, because they will, the, the problem is it's treated like a criminal case. I don't know. I'm thinking of Bear County. So it's over on the, it's over so kind the of DA on the had, I didn't side. have it in Travis County. I remember we didn't, we kept it out. I just don't remember. Because it was there so, wasn't e-filing right, probably at the, the time. Criminal at the yeah, time. the criminal at the but time. But since then, the standards committee has adopted codes yeah. to allow for juvenile e-filing. We mandated. do. But it's not mandated. Right. That's and so there are some that are e-filing, but it is all categorized. Because it's in paper? Or because no. it's not mandated? Because it's not mandated. But if the court said you juvenile e-filing, then you would just configure the codes and move on about your business. Correct. Okay. There's one so, other area. I'm well, just going to throw this right. out. Because there are areas like juvenile where, you know, by default or by law, it's for all intents and purposes sealed. Right, but, the it's, chapter, the, but it's the not chapter. sealed under 76A, right? So right, it's right, not, not under 76A, yeah. under something else. Right. But for instance, the uh, chapter 33 judicial bypasses, which are super, super, super secret proceedings. Um, and I think, I, I don't I don't think those are, even in Harris County, those are even, even scanned. Well, uh, so, so I think, yeah, I think it's a court by court practice. We went through all of those and read all of those statutes that talk about what's, because in order to do our civil filing, we presented a chart. I don't know if everybody, I have nightmares about it because I've 
ended up in the statutes all over the place um, to confirm all this. So we actually made sure we knew what by statute could not be visible. And then those were made, they were, they, you could e-file it, right? But it would not be um, uh, remotely accessible. So it said like, who got to see it? Nobody, right? So it was, it was kind of a matrix we created and that was looked at, the bypass was looked at, a ton of the family law stuff was looked at because there were categories of who would have access to it. Um, and actually, I think it was just um, uh, attorney's eyes only or something, or I, I can't even remember what the access was, but it was extraordinarily limited for juvenile and for bypass, for adoptions. That's, that's really out of court. So, so all that actually was done when we were deciding what could be e-filed because the court wanted everything e-filed, but we put all these restrictions on it in the matrix and I don't I don't have the matrix I can pull up right now but I don't I just remember doing yeah this. oh yeah we have the juvenile codes in yeah. the matrix for e-filing and they're also yeah. in the matrix for research yeah. but in research it's juvenile and none of it's shown so. yeah so we just completely limited the access so Bob you're making it sound like that that may be something that we make a recommendation yeah so recommendation for Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, as I, long as we can get the restriction uh, into the documents and make sure that it's not seen by right. well, we, everybody. We, well, we put it on, on, on the agenda and make sure that everything that we needed to do to do that has been taken care of. But we ought to move in that direction and that ought to be a future recommendation. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure that we put all that in. Yeah, for there. yeah, in the matrix, I've got it up here. It says juvenile all cases, and it has an X on the first right. two columns, which is. Uh, Thank you, Tracy, for having it, having that at the ready. Uh, so index info and docs show say X. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, it shows yeah. nothing. Wait, docs show index. Right, but, the, but I think part of the part of the discussion should be that TRC 21F states that electronic filing is required except in juvenile cases under Title III of the Family Code and truancy cases under Title III-A of the Family Code. So I, I know that I, I don't know of any clerks that are taking electronic filing in juvenile cases. The, the only juveniles that we take today are CPSs and and they have a restriction as well. Other than that, juvenile delinquency, we do not have set up. We don't have it. Uh, and it will take time to get that set up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not just a right. A yeah, so I, I do think then maybe even what it is what we do need to do, because looking at it, I don't see where we've put juvenile. I see where we put juvenile in to allow for electronic filing. But I think mm -hmm. we assumed that it would not be in research, but we need to verify yeah, that. Yeah, we, we assumed yeah. it wasn't going to be in research. But, but as long it's as we can verify that it's not going to be in research, then it may be that we just need to make a recommendation to the Supreme Court. You know, just like we did e-filing, we need to stagger juvenile being mandatory. Because I, I do remember when we did the initial mm -hmm. order, it was because mm -hmm. most jurisdictions took care of juvenile on the criminal side of thing of their systems. They do. They're yeah. more ready to and that was a problem. prosecutors and civil law prosecutors. Right. Mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, truancy court. Uh, uh, we we put information into the system and there is some of it that is sealed using the Odyssey procedure. Uh, but uh, we have to have something in the system to notify the parties of their court dates. So we use the e-filing only for the court date information and mm -hmm. the rest of it's suppressed. I don't see Terry uh, anymore. He, he stepped out for a second. Okay. My question would be this, uh, we started this discussion talking about sealed yeah. Yeah. Uh, filings. Uh, and he said it's a feature they have. I guess my question would be, what, what do they do to protect yeah. Sealed information is it just a flag? The records are the same in the database, but they just have a flag that says "Don't look here." Or do they actually encrypt the data so I no think, one can accidentally run across? Well, it? by default, 
our system is required to encrypt data in transit at rest. So, right, it doesn't that matter sealed or not. The encryption would be the same, which means if you can see an unsealed record, you can see a sealed record. No, the, unless you look at that flag and say, "No, I'm not allowed to." I think from a transitory e-filing standpoint, they can't see the documents in transit or arrest because it's been encrypted anyway. But yeah, I would imagine it's a flag so that when Tracy gets it on her end, she knows this is a sealed document coming through. And then once they transfer it to the case management system, you know, it'll be there for the standard 30 or 45 days. I can't remember what it's set at. So my recommendation is it's gone. My recommendation is one, let's refresh ourselves on our matrix and just try and make sure we understand what's going on yeah. there and what's going on with juvenile. Because I thought we had handled all that, but I want to make sure. And then secondly, on the sealed documents, let's make sure that Dennis, your question is answered. I would like to know what is the, is it a user access and nobody other than Tracy can possibly open this? Or is it, what is the the manner in which electronically they're managing that seal. Is it something to do with encryption? Is it something to do with just a don't touch this, but it's you know easily the, open? The, the commercial standard now is to use encryption. That's true. Everything's encrypted, but right. to use a set of keys that yes. are managed by an independent key management service, and then only the authorized emails can actually yes. get the key. Right. So even your backup service can back it up, but it can't tell what's in it. All it knows is there's data there. Only the authorized user email addresses can actually unlock that data and look at it. Yep. That would um, be the conventional way it's done today. I just right, because if this document landed in the error queue and it couldn't get through the process, so then our, is Tyler looking at this document right. to see what's wrong with it that's now seeing a sealed document? Right. Um, what happened? So there's Terry. So Terry, we were talking about sealed documents. Can you explain kind of how the experience works for everybody, specifically with with uh, uh, well, it's turned on in other places, so right. you should be familiar with it. Um, specifically with like what happens if something like is an error queue, or what kind of security is around it, so that we ensure that only the people that can see it should can see it. Yeah, it's it's a similar it's a similar security to how we have it today, and so you're managing it from two different locations. You're managing it from the e-filing side on what's submitted by managing those codes, case types, filing codes, things of that of that nature, and then that's applying it to the security that's in the configuration. So um, as part of the configuration of e-filing, when we do securities, there's mapping so that it tells it when it goes into the case management system, what kind of security to apply to those types of records that goes for documents, filing codes, case types, case categories, things like that. And then that also then is reflective inside of research so that it says, based upon those securities, do not publish or do not pull, do not store do not show and so it's it's based upon how it's configured but it, it it will pull from the source system which is the cms if that integration is present in, in research and then if it's not then it uses what's configured inside of e-filing to protect those records so as as tracy said it would take a little while to get set up meaning we have to work with each individual office that manages this, which I think is the juveniles would be at the district uh, level, if I'm not mistaken. So we'd work with each of those court uh, courts and clerks to get that configured correctly, uh, which which could vary depending upon whether it's integrated uh, court or not. So, so my question is why why is it even sent to research? I would think it'd be just like a lot of the other documents. It should not even be sent to research if it's sealed, right? That's right. That's that's what I, I said. Maybe I didn't communicate it correctly. So research has the configuration to say what gets sent there or what doesn't. So does e-filing. And so that's the configuration that we would that we would need to apply on those. So if that's shouldn't go to research, then we would configure that both on the e-filing side so that it could take care of those courts that are non-integrated. And then for those that are integrated, we would also do that in the CMS side to ensure that it didn't go because you're managing it from two different directions and integrated. 
reports, you're managing it from the incoming coming from e-filing and then also the incoming that come over the counter in the, in the event that it's an SRL filing. We still got to protect it from both angles. And so if it lands in the error queue and there's something wrong with that document and it's not able to process through, how, how is that handled on the Tyler side at looking at that file? It, it doesn't it doesn't make it through. It's still in the error queue. So it hasn't really formally been processed. The, the initiation hasn't fully completed. So until that process is complete, then it 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 doesn't ever make it past that gate, if you will. It's still stuck in the e-filing world. But if it's sealed, then let's say Tracy's staff and Tyler staff can't look at that document to see why it's in the air queue. So resolved. is that an automatic reject it and tell them to try it again? Oh, um, yeah, I think there would be processes around that, right? If we can't look at that document because it's it's in a sealed state, then yeah, I think we would have to return it back for correction. But it would be difficult for us to understand why unless the error code that was produced, which put it into the error queue, really defined why. A lot of times it could have been, you know, things like embedded fonts or, you know, they're using things that they shouldn't when filing. But if we're not allowed to open up that document, then it'd be difficult to, to tell that. Can I, can I ask a question here? Um, we keep talking about sealed documents. Now, unless it's sealed by statute, a document is not sealed unless a court seals it. Right. So... For the Court of Criminal Appeals, and I'm, I've been trying to keep my mouth shut through this because y'all keep talking about the civil rules, but the criminal rules is a different world over here. Uh, what we require, we require a motion for leave to file something under seal, but then we need the document that they're asking us to seal to determine if, in fact, we should seal it. So they've got to send us both. And right now, the criminal rules say you don't e-file sealed documents well again they're not sealed until the court seals them so is what you're talking about going to differentiate if we've got like a motion for leave to file and then the document which we haven't determined whether we're sealing or not is the system still going to be able to differentiate that otherwise every attorney could just say seal this document seal this document and then and and i remember a conversation in this group a long time ago about the possibility that attorneys could do that. How do we deal with that? Because it's, unless it's sealed by statute, it's not sealed until a court says it's sealed. So what do we do about that? So is that, but does that question get, get determined at the lower level, like it's in the trial court where these documents were either sealed or not sealed? Are there new documents coming up to the Court of Criminal Appeals where the lawyers say, here's some new stuff and can you seal this? Are Both. you, are they, okay, all right. Because that's not, okay. Sometimes it happens in the trial court. Sometimes it's an original matter up here. Oh yeah, okay. Sometimes something is sealed in the trial court that, I mean, we're a higher court. We can unseal it yep. or we can leave it sealed. So it goes both, it goes both ways. And I, I would think technologically we would have to rely on the lawyer and much like we do with marking documents containing confidential or sensitive information, yeah. we provide the box and ask them, are you sure you're sure? Yeah, yes. But Beyond that, there's I don't think there's anything programmatically we can do to guarantee that they are accurately checking the box to say this is indeed sealed. So I mean you and you've got a valid point, Sion. I mean, if if I were a lawyer and wanting to do gamesmanship, I'd seal absolutely everything so that nobody could see anything. So why don't they do that over the counter? Is it because of the eye contact? <laughs> I, I was gonna say that's a good point. So Dennis was saying, do they do that over the counter? How, why do they not do that over the counter? And maybe the answer is there's eye contact with the clerk. Because they know that they're playing, playing games. Well, and then we also got to remember and keep in mind, uh, especially on the civil side, is not there's not that many on the criminal side, just a few. But a judge can order the whole case to be sealed. And yeah. when the whole case is sealed, we don't even return that back to research Texas. Right. You just as say, a, I don't know what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, I don't know what case you're talking about. Um, so 
if those are now going to be returned, you got to make sure those aren't in research Texas and somehow flag those. Right. It, it's going to be a lot to try to get all of that working. Because once the case is sealed, then every document filed in it is sealed. All right. So it sounds like what we may want to do is, and Terry, I hope y'all are okay with this, but if there was a way that we could get maybe Tyler to demo what it would look like and then have a group look at that and ask questions to kind of get a feel for it, maybe help. Yeah, we'd, we'd, we'd be happy to. Yeah, and, and there's, there's, there's multiple forms of security is as tracy mentioned right you can have a document that's secured or, or sealed or you could have the entire case and obviously it's it's kind of like a hierarchy so if the case is sealed then everything in the case is sealed but if it's the case is unsealed and only the document is sealed then only that one document is sealed so yeah we'd be happy to to walk through what that looks like on the e-filing side both from the filer and the clerk as well as what happens within research in both an in integrated and non-integrated court it may also be helpful, Terry, if your product manager who has implemented in whatever state can explain what the hell did they do? How did they get yeah, over these issues and share that information with Casey because he can see what are they doing that's different than what we're doing. So let's plan on um, trying to kind of collect some information in between meetings so that we can report back out at the next meeting. So um, what I'll do is I'll arrange for a uh, a time we can have the demo and then just let everybody that wants to come in and be in that group. What I'd really like is for Tracy, you, because you handle it one way, John, you handle it another way. Um, I'd really like to kind of make sure we have the clerks that do both the physical hanging on to it, plus the, or the ones that have the electronic hanging on to it, plus somebody from the criminal courts that that um so we have a better understanding because you do get a bunch of original stuff that that you know uh that might be subject to of course sealing and so uh so that we can kind of look at what they do and make sure we all know and have everything in place that everything is secure um it's one thing I don't, I don't think it's that hard to make sure it doesn't get on research you know what i mean I, I think that's easy enough but my concern is, particularly on the Court of Criminal Appeals, you brought up a good point of people that are filing, when they file documents that have yet to be sealed, mm -hmm. and the press comes and says, we want to see all the documents that were filed today, including that motion to seal, will they let the, the press, for instance, go look at that motion to seal and the accompanying document that they no. want to have no. sealed? No. Okay. No. All right. Okay, so they, they can, treat it they as a motion to seal, but not the accompanying document. Okay, so they treat, even though it's not sealed, they we treat, treat it like for purposes sealed. of display as if it is sealed. That's what yes. I wanted to know. Okay, yes. so, because I was thinking, boy, that's pretty crazy if you did Yeah, until the court yeah. makes a decision, we treat okay. it as sealed, just so we don't run afoul. Yeah, and that's what, that's what the civil courts often do pending the, you know, pending a ruling. So, okay, that sounds that sounds great. So I, I'd like to take this up again next time and kind of get some sure. ideas about, do we even want to move in this direction or not? Um, do we want to talk now about that free access to research Texas for certain educational organizations and governments? Do you want to- Sure, I'll do that? real real quick. At our, um, at our last meeting, I reported on a, on a before COVID, um, work that was being done, we had received, I think, less than a handful, uh, Casey, uh, oh. of requests from certain educational institutions, I think, asking for free access to Research Texas. And so a subcommittee was put together to look at what, what are the issues that might come along with that, what criteria might be um, important. And what I was hoping to do was you know, lay out the criteria we had discussed and, and centered around with the hope of them coming back uh, later with a written formal recommendation for the committee. And so what we laid out really were four points. Uh, the first would be the ap an application would be required uh, for the free access, and it would require an explanation of the purposes of what the the project was and what the information be used. Uh, an, an agreement, it had to be a written agreement to, um, because the third one is 
um, we'd have to have names of who the actual users would be that would log, be logging in. And so that would mean if it was a class, for example, that was doing it, they'd have to be updating. They're responsible for saying who, who are the people going to be accessed. So we'd have to have an agreement um, between whoever in the, the university or the government agency so they know their obligation is to follow through that. And then, you know, the main one and the one we discussed, and I recall we just the most is, okay, who is this opened up to? And what, after discussing it through my recollection was that we, um, you know, I remember checking and there's over 200 colleges and yeah. universities <laughs> in the state. And so what the committee, subcommittee had come back with was um, Texas governmental agency or a public college or university. And after making that report, um, Bob had raised a, a question about uh, about that and, and how large is the scope. And in the meantime, if you look at your minutes from last meeting, uh, there it was mentioned that it was really maybe originally intended just for you know program where law students are involved. So um, so I had put together. Uh, just what, before I go, before we go and, and put together formal recommendations, maybe this is the item that we really ought to make certain everyone understands, because our recommendation was a Texas governmental agency. And so that would not technically, the way it's written, not include a municipality, not include a school district, possibly would include a county, because a county is a subdivision of the state of Texas. Right. Um Texas public college or university, which where we had, had, had uh, finalized, is a public university, a state. So that would not include SMU, SMU right. Baylor, not uh, right. including their law schools. Um, so, so that's really the point. And we thought because maybe at least as a start that you know this is kind of where we would start. But I've gone after seeing the discussion from last time, I've gone and said, I mean, I see three options. The, the one we've said, Texas Public College University, which wouldn't include a private college university nor their law schools. Uh, another option is Texas public and private colleges and universities, which would include the, the not just the private universities, but for profit. There are a number of for profit yeah. universities out there. And then lastly, you know, if, if we went just the law school accredited Texas law school. So I wanted, before coming back with any recommendation, I just kind of, like last time, wanted to kind of throw that out and see if there are any questions or major objections before we proceeded. Anyone have any guidance? So, so let me ask you this. The questions that you're having, what I can envision is that they're actually not so much law school, well, law schools, yes, but in terms of uh, people who want to do um, data research yes. right because it is going to it is a wealth of data as far as where a case is being filed what types of cases how are these being resolved That's those it. kind of things it looks like there's data that you can pick up through there not bad i mean i'm, right. I'm Just, thinking that they're going to write some article about it you know what i mean something like that somebody some somebody for their master's degree they're going to write something about it so i can see them for jurisprudence reasons right. whatever and justice doing something like that um, and is that who we're talking about? Are these are are they law school saying our law students want to have access to roam around? Well, that was my Texas? question this morning. I, I had kind of thought when I first when we first talked about this before COVID, it wasn't just law schools, but I honestly don't know. I just remember, and by the way, this isn't a lot. We haven't yeah, even in the meantime, we haven't right. received <laughs> right. And I my recollection of it, it was things like, you know, if if you're a law professor and you're saying yeah. go do research and here here's a resource for you you can go on research texas yes then we could go and make that a government class, class and, and say you know any email address ending in st mary's.edu let them through or law.stmary's.edu they can have so free, remind free me, access in our current state where we are right now because i remember like the freebie at the beginning and all that sort of stuff so if there's a law student who says, oh, I want to go on Research Texas, yep. okay, well, he's supposed to have a bar card. So, you know what I mean? Or yeah. something, if he wants to look at certain things. Attorney-only things, Attorney-only yeah. things, right? Otherwise, he's going on just as a member of the public. Just like right? I would. Just yeah. like you would. Okay. Just and that's free. That's free for me to see that a case exists and yeah. here, here are the documents yeah. that are available. Yeah. If I want to go read a document, Right. Then I got to pay. Yeah. Okay. So that is that phase. And then they pay and that money goes to who? The county. The county. Okay. So if we're offering this freebie to all of these people or entities, right? What is that just who absorbs that cost or, or 
Yeah, I mean, that's yeah, it just it means that that money does not go to the, that there is no money exchanged. Okay. And what I foresee is that when criminal does whatever yes. make it to research, that's where you're going to start seeing, especially research the the research yeah. being done from the justice advocates Correct. that are tied Correct. with university Correct. programs yeah. or government agencies. Okay. Yeah, that. and okay. then it'll be a bigger, bigger thing. How, how do we control abuse if Meta creates the public institute of public data and they hand out certificates to employees? What stops Facebook from well, it, we, we've only we've thing. limited only Texas. I mean, so none of the none of the options I've given are outside of Texas or Texas. But yeah, I mean, it's certainly they, well, they're I mean, doing business I mean, here. I mean, yeah. well, I mean, so everybody's got the public, right? They're they're yeah. roaming around public. This was set up public yeah. and get on, right? right? And look around. So that's and and as long cool. as they're paying as they go, then we don't we don't have the risk of massive abuse of right. data. I, I would whatever. imagine with the application process telling me. What, why do you yeah. want on here? Why do you need and who? It's not everybody with a St. Mary's email under this. Right. It's right. This you is can, a class where I'm going to have this assignment, and these are these two. These are the ones well, on there. And what I would do is have them timed. How much time? Is this a one day pro? Is it a one day deal right. or is it a one month deal? Right. So you need a time thing because you want that baby gone. Right. So right. the you application should done. definitely have an expiration date. Absolutely. Yeah. Now they do you need the expiration date. But you need some if we're going to go down this route, mm -hmm. which is why I raised the scope thing with the table a while back. Yeah. Is what are we going to use as a criteria to say yes or no? Correct. That's because and that's where and that's where that's 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 why I think I think we talked a little about that as well. Yeah. We settled on just a Texas university or Texas governmental agency because they're not going to sue Texas for you know for this or less likely to. But when we open it up to everybody for free access, then we start we're gonna have to we're gonna have to approve every one of them or really being able to justify why we're saying no to any one of them. Well, and then you're going to get people to go, well, why do they all get free access? That means that we don't, well, it's, nobody should have to pay. It's our I system. I mean, it's the, I mean, it's the state of Texas is paying for this. It's the yeah. county. So it's our system. We're not charging ourselves. Okay. If well, you're we stuck in Texas. I mean, essentially yeah. the state is paying Tyler to host this. It's yeah. Not right. free. So, so don't charge Texas. Like, I don't think we do right now. I mean, our county, we're not charging ourselves. So a Texas university is what this would add in. A public university. Now, this may defeat the purpose, but I feel like there has to be some discussion about republishing any of this data, using it inside your classroom or inside your law school as much. So I would imagine that. But if it becomes a publication in the exactly. law review, it becomes a public document right. published in a different But they could have bought it and, and published it. It's just around the Yes. Place. But again, it's, it's not a question of whether the data is secret. It's controlling unlimited publication. I'm, I'm, this is one of the very first things we talked about when I joined yeah. this committee. How do we stop data harvesters? Yep, right. And the only way you can do it is charge them a dime a page or something yeah. because they won't, that, that's too much. Right. They won't do it. It doesn't have to be very high fee, but once you take fees away, that one barrier starts. So that argues fees. with a limited and in, in a governmental institution or not at all, or just law schools. Or I mean that. I think there's there's value to it. I don't want to suppress. The, well, I mean, the, the question is, then, academic do you, benefit, but can you do it? You're using people or the identified person as the proxy for they've got a legitimate purpose that that is yeah. worthy, a worthy purpose because they're lost by a worthy purpose. I'm just wondering if we look at it more as what are they trying to do with the data, and then if depending on what they're doing with the have have that also be part of the criteria in terms of who do we want to give this well, free stuff I, to? I, hearing you, I can understand. I'm a student, but I also have a data harvesting you know, side. I get in this class because I know what they, one of the projects is, so I get approved, and then I use my free access to just download everything I can. But you know, don't we have the same, don't we have restrictions on, That's on lawyers and how everything much, else, how right, much, on yeah. how that works, so the same parameters that we've created to prevent data harvesting. That's for, teary. It's like I couldn't, can anyone just get into Research Texas and run I mean, they can't, I mean, there's some, no, there's, there's some there's, stop gap. There's a governor there's in there. There's human governors yeah. in there. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. Well, 
Okay, so so this is a good and worthy discussion. Um, what what do we need to know for you to make your decision? Well, I'm going to set the committee back up together so we write it. I really need to know really scope how broad. Uh, we can come back with whatever well, I mean, we recommend, we, and this committee is going to have the same discussion. Right. Well, I have a concern about opening it to the world yeah. and the counties don't get paid. I mm -hmm. mean, I just, I, sure. you know, and it's it's not like, anyway, so I think we do need to make it tight, both as to who will have access to start with, recognizing if everything goes smoothly, it's all fine, that we can add. Yeah. So I maybe agree. start with a, with a beta test. Yeah with maybe a, you know awesome. some specific organizations and then really vet the purpose yeah. and then and then see how that works before we expand out and just kind of go Probably well reasonable. it could be all the colleges yeah. so yeah. i'm fine with that and and the obvious one guidance? is the was the, the law schools is the obvious one yeah. because we can pretty much know what their purposes are going to be right and, um, well now as, hang on remember many law schools have and again that's this gets more into criminal than civil, but many law schools have clinics where they're actually with a supervising attorney representing defendants so that it's getting into the practice of law and you are actually allowing them free research for cases. So there may be a purpose distinction in there too, class purpose versus a clinic purpose, which One. then you know, attorneys associated with law schools get free research, but attorneys representing similar clients on the outside don't. We can work on that's a good idea. We can look at that because I think some of the clinics as a government agency or something don't some of them get free stuff anyway. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. A couple other yeah. issues. There's a couple other issues uh, in terms of making this public. Uh, can the admissions department? Uh, make decisions based upon what they see for a particular student. I don't know. Uh, what What about scholarships uh, and uh, offering scholarships? Do they want to do a criminal and a civil check on those cases that are filed? Um, the reason I'm sensitive to this is I had about 40 cases filed by a student who was, um, what shall I say, evicted from Texas A&M University filed suit against uh, individual professors, the president of the school, the board of regents, everybody. Each one was a separate case. Do you want people that have that kind of information? Does the school need that information? And, and should the individual who's filing these multiple cases uh, have all that information available to the schools as well? I think it's for a particular purpose. Yeah. I mean, it's not just a blanket. Yeah, if you go to this university, you get it. Yeah. I'm envisioning that you've got to file an application it's, and go, this is exactly what we're going to do with this data for X amount of time period for this purpose. Yeah, it's a clinic, it's a class, it's something, and I'm requiring my students to do this kind of research. And so they don't have to go out and spend their own money to do it. They're going to get free access under this program, which right, limited by time. And they've got a, the professor, I imagine, is the one that's going to be submitting it and explaining the program and under a qualified organization. And it's information that anyone's going to get it's it's there it just is saving them the cost but no that student that you're talking about would have to matriculate into another you know university and then be in a class or in a program that makes the application includes that student's name and the university and then when they do checks and background checks they got a lot better more no, no offense probably robust system than especially if someone's been removed from the university if someone's been yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I don't, I mean, we would really work to keep that from happening. You know what I mean? Yeah. From the, the being taken advantage of. I mean, I would hope that we'd have a really tight yeah. program well, that's to all, start with. I'll reconvene the committee when that's helpful yeah. information and we'll take a run through it and come back with a recommendation yeah. for us to discuss. Okay. Goodbye. All right. Okay. And then finally, there's a couple of things that have been going on and it's something that we're probably going to have to have at each meeting. And it's called, you know, issues in the field. And one of them was, clerks charging their own made up fees for things and lawyers not not knowing that they needed to pay a dollar a page for an e-filing um, in particular 
courts and did that get taken care of? Yeah, so, um, and this is just, just so for everybody's awareness and, and OCA will continue down the path that we continue to go down. And so uh, as an example, we had an incident this past month where an attorney had gotten in contact with Justice Simmons to where a district clerk was charging every attorney a buck a page to file something. To e-file something. So you you wanted it, this particular attorney wanted to e-file a no fee motion that was a hundred pages long. And the clerk sent it back for correction and said, you need to go back and file it. They didn't send it back for correction. Oh, they they rejected it. Oh, so he didn't get the didn't get the day even. Not only did he get head slapped and not get his thing filed, he didn't even get the date for that. He had to resubmit it with the hundred bucks and got a new date. And what was the you reason that the clerk gave? Not enough money, honey. You didn't put you didn't give well, him hundred bucks. We, yeah, I think this person called me too, Rebecca. I think this attorney called me and he, he explained uh, the clerk was charging a dollar a page to print it out to put into the paper file. Right. That's right. And so when Justice Simmons alerted me to that, um, OCA had Sherry Woodfin, who is our resident um, court services clerk on staff or former clerk, and spoke with the district clerk who, who is now putting a, committed to putting a stop to that practice, but is has basically said, you know, you're running in, you're running afoul of the rules and everything that is holy to the court. You need to stop doing this. So I, I think that clerk ended up refunding that person their money and committed to stop it. doing it under threat of, of mandamus in the future. That well, if he didn't pay it, it wasn't going to get filed. So it just, yeah, it was, a, it was. Um, and so I, I guess the, with all of this and then, you know, uh, poor Mark Unger has been experiencing uh, wonderful things going on in Bear County. And uh, I, I was, in, well, I don't know, fortunate is the right word, but I was, I was on a nice town hall meeting with the district clerk and <laughs> what was going on there. And it, it's, and, and again, I think it's the same thing of that OCA is happy to, to work with clerks or organizations. And I think JCIT is in the same position. We are happy to go out and visit to make sure that everybody's clear on what the rules say and how things should be operating. Um, but we are getting some goofy things coming across so, the line. Yeah, so Bear County is just kind of on fire. It's just... Uh, it just on fire in lack of knowledge of even how their own system that they have now purchased works and how the processes they need to make it work. And they keep blaming the vendor and it doesn't appear to be a vendor problem. My uh, request is that we go ahead and appoint a subcommittee for JCIT. I would like to have Mark Unger on it. I would like to have Lamont Jefferson in San Antonio and get some lawyers that are knowledgeable on it. Um, and then uh, basically go in in a very nice way, not telling them what to do, but ask if we can sit down and maybe kind of assist them um, with these issues that they seem to be having where they can't give the lawyers any orders and they, you know, they just, um, they seem to just have difficulties. And so that is my recommendation. I, this is John Warren, if I can, I'm not quite sure how someone is able to charge a fee that is not uh, approved. Uh, and well, from what I understand, and, and I know- let me let me let you know that this guy was also a legislative lawyer, like an expert on legislation and worked in, you know, during the legislative session. So he would ask that question. Yeah. Can you show me where it has that but, fee? Right. But, but, so, uh, but all of the, all of the fee, all of the fees that we collect uh, is based on statute. And we work with the, with the county auditors because it goes into the, the to the, um, they have to have the general ledger. There's a GL code for all of those. And every Every fee that's collected is associated with the statute that says to us for us to collect it and where that money goes once it's collected. Or you're liable for triple damages, triple damages right. if you don't have a statutory authority. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's right. Just, that's right. 
I think this was, um, you know, probably the the, the county telling them, you know, if you're going to print and file, somebody has to cover that printing cost, go collect something. And maybe somebody just wasn't knowledgeable. I don't know. But it was really, um, it was unfortunate. But I think education, and most clerks know this, John and, and Tracy, mm -hmm. uh, that this is kind of crazy. So I'm hoping this is a one-off and that right. we don't continue to get things like this. Well, right. Rebecca, um, I, I anecdotally on a Facebook group of lawyers heard of a, it was cast as the judge was doing this, but they couldn't get their motion for default judgment heard without paying a signing fee. Now that's third, third hand. I don't know what county, I don't know what judge, uh, you know, and sometimes lawyers hear things one way um, and so forth, but uh, you know, with a with 254 counties and, and so much diversity in our state, you know, there are going to be a few people that um, aren't as as diligent and and effective as John and 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 so forth. Uh, I've never heard any problems like this out of uh, out of John's shop. Uh, so rest assured about that. Oh. Uh, and I wouldn't I would be shocked if I did. But there are some places where they you know. Uh, and I don't think it's out of any malice or anything. I think it's more out of a uh, uh, lack of knowledge. Um, so that's all I'll say. Yeah. And, and what? I, what I, I guess I would like to say is that, you know, just continued commitment by OCA and JCIT that as anybody hears anything like this going on to bring it to the table so that we can get it addressed and, and, figure out a path forward to put them back on the right track. Do attorneys have an ombudsman somewhere in OCA that they can call on to say, so I'm wondering, I need yeah. your help? Because you're at 250 work counties, it could be a clerk who's got an ax to grind, or maybe they don't know. Or I, don't, I think it's a good gig, a signing fee. I'm just wondering where who gets that. Say, you know, really is that <laughs> I, I would say that like um, in this particular case, if. Yeah. Justice Simmons hadn't said, hey, I was surfing the lawyer only group of the whatever bar association, wherever you were looking at and found this. I wouldn't have known about it. But as soon as I know about it, then we can take action on it. So I'm not sure that OCA has a particular person. But if OCA, if anybody at OCA knows about it, then we typically will route it around to get it to the right person to be dealt with. Well, so, the OCA is the arm of the Supreme Court. But we, we are not the police. Not and the, the, other, police. the other thing is, is we have no power to mandamus well, Clark. But you guys can at least, you've got a communication channel. Oh, absolutely. Ways. I'm we, just wondering if, you know, it's about time maybe after these meetings, we seem, particularly after this meeting, we seem to have things we need to communicate to the bar and to the public. I wonder right. if we just put the last thing on there, you know, experiencing issues, <laughs> problems. Call Casey. Yeah, or I mean, <laughs> call OCA. You can call me too. But I mean, if I know about it, then I just feel like e-filing is just the instrument of Correct. the mistake or the abuse. It's not the cause of it. Right. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. It, it's being used for abuse. E-filing doesn't cause yeah. mistakes. Right. Humans cause mistakes, or whatever language you want to use. There, it just seems. With, with regard to that, yeah, I think that's some that that's a good um, subject for um, uh, the Clerks Association's Education Conference. I absolutely agree. Yeah. Just and collect these different issues, and then the clerks can kind of run through them as examples and that sort of thing. And, um, and I, I would say, John and Laura and the other clerks, if if whatever powers you have with CDCAT, OCA is more than happy to come out to conferences. I know every time we go out and host like mm -hmm. questions on e filing, we get a, a and it's a good discussion of clerks bringing up, hey, what about this? And usually one clerk will ask a question and then I don't have to answer it. There'll be three other clerks to say, well, this is how we do it and how you should yeah. be doing it. Right. Well, I, I think a lot of it probably stemmed from Senate Bill 41 and understanding exactly all the speed changes. I agree. And, and, you know, we got that cheat sheet from OCA, but there's right. three versions of it. So if somebody didn't get the third one, okay. or, or, or something, you know, if, if that was simplified enough to the clerks, maybe that would help the session. 
because I don't even know how they got that fee configured in Utah, Texas, because you know, you can't figure anything outside the technology standards. So I don't know how it was even done. I I don't know. Well, for what fee? Whatever they were oh no, right. I can tell you exactly how it was done. Hit reject button, call the attorney. No, no, the, no go to additional services, put paper copy a hundred pages. So copy. Not file. No, right? go copy, hit 100 copy. pages. I'm going to charge you the $100. And then That's I'll it because accept. they have to copy it, not your copy. So they it's, have con to copy it's configured it in, to yeah. the standards. It's just it's yeah. loopholing it in so yeah. that you get your money. Right. Right. And, I, and I suppose okay. in some places, it's not hard to imagine a clerk being told your office budget I, is based on I'm your okay. fees of service. I, I agree. And so if a clerk is running short or there's pressure, of all kinds, uh, yes. they're going to look for how do I increase my fees of office to cover the cost to, to cover the cost and bingo. Okay, no, we're past no, no. so so I am going to wrap this up. I do want to say one thing. Um, sadly, um, uh, Chief Justice Brian Quinn has asked to be um, has asked that this or the that he wasn't going to be here today, and this is his last official meeting. Um, he's stepping off JCIT. He served us for a very long time, did a great job, helped shepherd through e-filing across the state, and he will be sorely missed. I've asked him to, you know, please give me some names of, um, of some judges that he thinks, uh, appellate justices uh, that might be of interest. But anyway, I just wanted to let um, everyone know and um, make it official that we definitely will miss him and his expertise. Um, with that, I'm going to adjourn. Uh, do we have the next date for our meeting? Or are we going to? It's in August. I'd have to go look okay. it up. So the, our next meeting will be in August. Um, we will be sending around, we'll be working in between on a number of these committees and on language uh, for the 21A kind of service situation and some other things. We'll send around an action item list just so we don't lose track of what we need to get done before the next meeting. With that, we stand adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you, all. Thank you everybody. Thank you.